Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you this month's installment of E4C's 2018 Off-Grid Energy Webinar Series, focusing on generating off-grid power. My name is Mariela Machado, and I'm the Program Manager at Engineering for Change. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. The webinar you are participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide that you're seeing on your screen. Information on upcoming webinars is available on our webinars page. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our hashtag E4C webinars, as you see on the screen as well. Before we move to our presenter today, I would like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and soil social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities all over the world. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, lack of internet, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provide access to news and thought leaders, insights and on hundreds of essential technologies on our solutions library, professional development resources and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources that are aligned to your interests. For more, please see our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. Today's webinar is the third in the Off-Grid Energy webinar series. Additional topics covered in the series are drawn from the book Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries, authored by our presenter, Dr. Henry Louis. The future webinars in this series are listed on this slide and will be announced via our newsletter. E4C members will receive the information directly in their, in their mailbox, so be sure to sign up. For reference, you can find examples of off-grid energy products like the Mobisol Solar Home System in the E4C Solutions Library. There you can learn more about technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models of these systems. All the information is sourced by E4C research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts. This solution and many more are available to E4C members free of charge, so be sure to check out the Solutions Library. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice using the WebEx platform by telling us where you are in the world right now. So in the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type your location right now. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. You can use this window to share remarks during the webinar. And if you have technical questions, just send a private chat to engineer for change admin. Let's see where you guys are joining us from. Cincinnati, Los Angeles, Denmark, welcome. Ontario, Canada, Netherlands, Uganda, UK, Ghana, wow, we have from all over the world today, Nashville, Tennessee, welcome everyone. I saw India earlier today too, so welcome everyone. So through this chat, you can also share remarks as mentioned uh, uh, before, so be sure to do that. But during the webinar, please be sure to use the Q&A window, which is a different one, located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter. The presenter will have 15 minutes at the end of the, of the presentation, uh, so be sure to type your questions there. 
If you don't see it, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. If you see webinars, qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. As you see on the link uh, on, on the slide. A special note about today's webinar, we will stop, as I mentioned be, uh, before, 15 minutes uh, before the hour, so 11.45 Eastern Time. But um, so be sure to, to type in your questions during the presentation, okay? So now let's get started, but before we do that, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Henry Louis is an associate professor at, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Seattle University. His re research areas include electricity access in developing communities, renewable energy, and appropriate technology. He is the president and co-founder of Kilowatts for Humanity, a nonprofit organization providing electricity access and business opportunities in sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Louis served as a Fulbright Scholar to Coprovide University in Kidwe, Zambia. He is recognized as a distinguished lecturer at the, of the IEEE and is an associate editor of the journal Energy for Sustainable Development. He is author of the book Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries, published by Springer and Nature. So without further to say, I want to welcome Dr. Henry Louis. So over to you, Henry. Welcome and thank you for joining us, everyone. So, so it's fantastic to be uh, back here giving uh, my third webinar as part of our off-grid electrical system um, webinar series. And today we're going to be talking about how we actually supply power to off-grid systems. Uh, as was mentioned in my introduction, I'm an associate professor at Seattle U where I teach in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I also am president of a nonprofit that works in off-grid electricity access known as Kilowatts for Humanity, and I've previously been on the steering committee of IEEE Smart, Brit, uh, Smart Village and uh, have been a Fulbright Scholar. So today's uh, webinar is going to be following a few chapters of the book Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries. If you want to know more about today's topic or the other topics in our other webinars, I encourage you to go uh, and get a copy of the book. It's available on Amazon uh, in hard copy or on Kindle. It's also available through the, the publisher's website, uh, Springer, and you can also uh, access it through uh, my website, drhenrylouis.com. So the, the book covers uh, many topics, and today's webinar is going to focus on uh, three of the chapters uh, in particular. And of course, it's challenging to cover three entire chapters in a uh, 35 or 40 minute presentation. So if you really wanna know uh, more, more of the, the details, I would encourage you to check out those chapters. Uh, it includes example problems and uh, um, lots of other uh, details that we won't be able to get into today. So today's webinar, we're gonna talk about the fundamental operating principles of the energy conversion technologies that you commonly encounter in off-grid systems. And the off-grid systems that I'm gonna be talking about today are those that are perhaps one kilowatt to maybe 100 kilowatts uh, in size. So nothing larger than that and nothing really smaller than that. And as you see, there's gonna be quite a few types of uh, technologies that we're gonna discuss uh, in the next while here. So to, to center ourselves, let's, let's think about an off-grid system, and we'll generically call it a mini-grid. You can really take an off-grid system and, and, um, and break it up into three subsystems, an energy production system, a distribution system, and the end-use system. In our last webinar, we did talk a bit about distribution systems, and in this webinar, we're really gonna focus on the energy production system, in particular, the energy conversion technologies. So the technologies that uh, generate the electricity that the users of the system um, consume. Off-grid systems generally are supplied by one or more of these five types of energy conversion systems. Uh, generator sets, hydro turbines, 
photovoltaic arrays, wind turbines, or biomass of some, some sort. Uh, and there's actually quite a few different ways of using biomass. So we're going to talk about uh, each of these types of energy conversion technologies in this webinar. Now, with the exception of photovoltaic arrays, all of the other energy conversion technologies ultimately rely on some sort of generator to produce electricity. So we're going to talk a little bit about generators. Now, there's two types of generators. There's AC generators and there's DC generators. And there's several subtypes within those two uh, categories. Now, in most off-grid systems, you see AC generators rather than DC. You might see DC generators in specialty wind turbines, but for the most part, we see AC generators in off-grid systems. Within AC generators, there's two types. There's synchronous generators, and then there's induction generators. And both of these are used in off-grid systems. Uh, however, induction generators are, I would say, less common. Uh, remember that an induction generator requires some source of reactive power to be able to function. And so you end up having to either have another generator, like a synchronous generator, that can supply that reactive power, or you might have some uh, capacitors. So although induction generators are used, uh, typically it's synchronous generators uh, that are used. And, and so that's going to be the focus of our discussion here over the next few minutes. So synchronous generators are always powered by some sort of prime mover. And that prime mover can be a combustion uh, engine, a wind turbine, a hydro turbine. In other words, something that can provide mechanical power uh, input to that generator. Now shown on the right-hand side of the slide is a a cutaway of a, of a synchronous generator. The synchronous generators are really composed of, of two parts. We have a stator and we have a rotor, and they're separated by a small air gap. The stator is a stationary part of the, the generator, so it doesn't move. Uh, inside that stator are a bunch of coils of wire, and these coils of wire are going to be ultimately connected to the load to supply electricity. The rotor itself contains either a permanent magnet or an electromagnet. And voltage is induced in the coils in the stator when the rotor rotates uh, according to Lenz's law. So briefly, what Lenz's law tells us is that the voltage that we, uh, we, we get in a coil is related, it's proportional to the number of turns of, of coils multiplied by the rate of change of the magnetic flux. So that rotor is producing a magnetic field, and so flux is passing through those coils. And as the flux passes through those coils, the voltage is induced. Now, there's a few consequences from Lenz's law that are important to our discussion today. The first is that we can uh, adjust the induced voltage by adjusting the strength of the magnetic field. So if we have an electromagnet on our rotor, we can adjust the strength of the magnetic field by adjusting the current to that electromagnet, and then we are able to control the voltage. The second consequence of Lenz's law is that it's the rate of change of flux that ultimately induces a voltage. So if we spin the rotor faster, if our hydro turbine or wind turbine rotates faster, we're going to get a, a higher voltage induced, which may be a good thing, but it could also be a bad thing. Now, related to this is that as we rotate our rotor faster, the frequency of the voltage will also increase. And so this can be a challenge because, for the most part, when we supply AC power to a load, we want to do it at constant frequency and constant voltage. So if we have an energy conversion technology whose speed can't be uh, regulated very well, what we're going to end up with is a frequency and voltage that, that fluctuates with that rotor speed. And so this obviously is something we don't want to do. And so really, when we think about uh, energy conversion technologies, we really need to use those that are capable of being governed in some way. So in other words, they need to have their speed to be able to be controlled. And uh, we see that with gen sets and micro hydro, it's very easy to control their speed. Something like a wind turbine, unfortunately, it's very difficult to control the speed. You know, if the wind isn't blowing, then you uh, will have a very difficult time making that wind turbine rotate. And so what we see is we see wind turbines used in systems where um, we have batteries, and so we convert the, the electricity they produce to DC anyway, and so we're less concerned about their frequency. Now, we also have a, a similar constraint with the, our voltage. We, uh, 
we want the voltage supplied to the load to be uh, relatively constant. Uh, however, as the current flows through the coils of the generator, and it encounters uh, resistance and inductive reactants uh, associated with those coils. And what that means is the voltage that we get at the, the terminals of our generator is different than the voltage that's induced. And depending on the load, that voltage at the terminals could be higher, but most likely lower than the induced voltage. Um, and this will depend upon the amount of current that is flowing. And this is a bad thing that we want to avoid. So how we how we correct for this is we can adjust the strength of the magnetic field uh, to our, our, um, our rotor, and uh, we can adjust the induced voltage and we can correct for any voltage drop that might occur. And so we use a device called an automatic voltage regulator to do that, and those are found uh, in, in most gen sets and micro hydro power systems. But the real bottom line is um, only, we can only directly couple an energy conversion technology to an AC load if that the energy conversion technology is capable of having its speed and voltage regulated. If you can't regulate the speed or the voltage, then most likely you're going to actually have to convert to DC before uh, using an inverter to convert to an AC load. So let's talk about our first uh, energy conversion technology, and that's gen sets. Now, gensets are, I would say, by far the most common off-grid power source. Uh, certainly, there are hundreds of millions of gensets that are around, uh, installed around the world. They can be small, uh, maybe just a few hundred watts, as shown in the top figure, or they can be quite large and permanently installed, and you know, they can be hundreds of, of uh, kilowatts in size for sure. Now, gensets are popular because they're relatively inexpensive, at least to purchase, they, the challenge is they have high operating costs because they rely on, on a fuel source. There's a few different types of, inter of, of gen sets um, depending on the nature of its internal combustion engine, uh, like a spark ignition, like a, in a petrol generator, uh, common in most cars, or it can be a compression ignition, which is found in, in diesel cars. So the, the basics of how a genset works is we have some sort of fuel and air that we feed into uh, an internal combustion engine. <clears throat> After combustion, we get mechanical power on the engine's crankshaft, which we is coupled to the generator's rotor. Uh, and again, rotating that rotor will provide electrical power if connected to a load. Uh, because we can regulate the flow of fuel and air into the internal combustion engine, we are able to moderate its, its speed, and so we can take a gen set and directly couple it with an AC load. Now, when we talk about gen sets, uh, the fuel source really matters, uh, and you can design a, a gen set to take you know, petroleum, uh, diesel, but also biofuels, uh, like uh, biofuel or even uh, biomass-derived syngas and biogas, but also things like methane and hydrogen can, can be used in different types of gen sets. Now, like I said, the fuel consumption of a gen set is one of our biggest concerns because it's a, it is a, can be expensive. So it's important that we operate a gen set in a way that minimizes the, the fuel consumption or, or maximizes the efficiency. So that top diagram shows the, the allocation of fuel to different, um, uh, different categories depending upon the loading of, of the generator. So at very low load, most of the energy, most of the fuel that you provide that gen set goes into the exhaust or, or heat transfer or friction, or friction. As you start to load the generator, supplying more power, uh, the efficiency of the generator increases. More and more uh, power is provided to the generator and, and, um, and less as a proportion to friction and the other sources. So this tells us that we should always operate a gen set uh, at, at high loading, uh, if possible. The other thing we need to consider is the size of the gen set. So gen sets are, you know, uh, rely on thermodynamic cycles, and when we have a larger gen set, um, the we'll, we'll be able to operate more efficiently. So a, a 100 kVA gen set will be more efficient than, say, a 10 can, 10 can, <coughs> excuse me, 10 kVA gen set. So basically, we'd rather have uh, fewer but larger capacity gen sets than a bunch of small capacity gen sets if possible. And so this also impacts how we might load our gen set. So if we have a, a, a gen set that 
needs to, needs to supply, for example, a 100 kilowatt hours over the course of a day, and we are able to dictate when that energy is provided, uh, one strategy would be to load the genset at a low level and provide consistent power throughout the day. Uh, the other option would be um, to maybe load it fully and supply power, uh, high power uh, for a few hours. So this could be in a scenario where we're pumping, uh, pumping water or something where it doesn't necessarily need to be on demand. We, as long as we pump a certain volume of water over the course of the day, we're happy. So given these two options, which one should we pick in order to minimize uh, fuel costs? Well, the, the one on the right is really the one that we should pick uh, because we're going to be loading our generator at near full capacity, and so it's going to operate more efficiently. So you can actually save quite a bit of fuel using a strategy like this, if possible. It also means that the genset is operating fewer hours a day, so there's less noise, and the operational hours are, are decreased, so that genset is actually going to last uh, longer. So some considerations about gensets. Um, we really like them, again, because they're relatively inexpensive. They range in capacities from hundreds of watts to, to megawatts even. Uh, you can start up a genset on demand, and this is a big advantage over solar or wind uh, because, you know, a wind turbine can't produce wind if it's not windy, and neither can a, a solar power a solar panel if it's not sunny. So the fact that we can on demand produce electricity is a big advantage of gensets. They're also pretty easy to control. A lot of the control is, is automated, and smaller gensets are portable. Now, balancing those advantages are, are several disadvantages, and most of these are related to the fact that you have to supply fuel to the genset. So fuel is expensive. You also have to manage the whole fuel supply chain. You have to store it on site. You have to make sure that you uh, have a supply of fuel that's dependable. And in some, some communities, they're so rural, that you spend more money on transporting the fuel to your site than the fuel itself. And so the cost can, can increase significantly. Gensets also uh, have a relatively short lifespan, so maybe 20 to 30,000 hours before they need to be uh, uh, refurbished. And so this can be a consideration uh, as well. Now, like I said earlier, gensets can be provided with fossil fuels, but they can also be uh, uh, fueled with biomass more generally. Uh, biomass is distinguished from fossil fuels in that the organic material in biomass was uh, recently alive. And so when we think about biomass, we think of crop residue, uh, animal waste, animal manure, even food uh, and human waste, uh, also uh, forest products from you know, cutting down trees and so forth. So these are all different biomass feedstocks. Um, so of course we can't just take crops and feed it directly into a uh, internal combustion engine to power it, we have to process it. And so when we talk about biomass systems, we're really talking about processing biomass into a fuel that's more convenient than the, the raw biomass itself. And I'll also point out that biomass, uh, most of the biomass systems that you see out there aren't used ultimately for electricity generation. They're used for perhaps heating and cooking instead. But Nonetheless, there are still many examples where biomass is used as a feedstock to, to a generator to produce electricity. So there are a few ways that we can convert biomass into a fuel that can be used in an internal combustion engine. Uh, we can use anaerobic digestion. So this is basically using microbes to digest uh, like wet biomass, so for, for example, manure. And over time, it will produce a combination of methane and carbon dioxide, which we can uh, burn or combust in an engine. We can also make synthesis gas or syngas, and I'll talk about that uh, on the next slide here. And uh, also, we can just take the biomass directly, we can dry it, we can chop it up, and then we can burn it and, for example, create steam that we can use in a steam turbine. So this would be more common in larger uh, industrial fa uh, facilities where we might use this solid biomass directly. So syngas is biomass that has been turned into um, a combination of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and a little carbon dioxide using a thermochemical reaction. So what we do here is we take a, a, a vessel called a reactor. It's a big metal tank, and we put dried biomass up at the top. So this could be uh, like 
you know, sugar cane stock, for example, we put in the top. And inside the, the vessel, it's quite hot due to several of the reactions that are occurring within. So the biomass begins drying because of the heat. And as the temperature increases, uh, pyrolysis occurs. And pyrolysis is the same reaction that occurs when we make charcoal. So basically, you take organic material, you heat it to a high temperature in the absence of oxygen so it doesn't um, it doesn't combust. Uh, and under these conditions, you basically end up with char, which you can think of as mostly just carbon. So you take those organic compounds and you are able to just uh, convert it to straight, straight carbon. Now, a little bit further down the vessel, we introduce air and, and also maybe some steam. And that carbon is going to combine with the air uh, through oxidation, re, uh, <clears throat> yielding carbon dioxide. Now, a little bit further down, we'll actually have reduction that occurs. So that carbon uh, reacts with the water in the steam or the water in the air, and it splits the H2O into uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So we're able to get hydrogen um, H2 out of the, the vessel. And that's really where the energy in our syngas comes from. So we can take this syngas and we can use it, uh, we can input it into an internal combustion engine, saving on the the diesel that it would have consumed so you can fire this internal combustion engine using a mixture of hydrogen and diesel and you will ultimately reduce the diesel consumption by maybe 80 percent or so so syngas is used um in in many places i think india is probably the leader of using uh, syngas based electricity uh, production so some of the practical considerations about biomass, uh, you know, biomass, depending on how you produce it, uh, the byproduct could be used as a fertilizer, so that's particularly biogas. Um, you can store the biomass fuel on, on site. Uh, you don't have to wait for the sun to rise or the wind to blow. Um, biomass can be um, uh, create employment in rural areas collecting uh, the crop waste, and so it can improve cash flow. But there are several disadvantages. Um, so you still require a gen set. So all the advantages and disadvantages of the gen sets that we just talked about also apply here. You also have to supply, uh, maintain the, the flow of your feedstock. And so this can be a challenge, especially if the feedstock is based on a crop that might be seasonal. You also have to be careful not to compete with uh, crops that might be grown for food. So generally speaking, we don't want to replace food crops with energy crops. Um, and that can have some very, very uh, uh, negative effects to local communities. And um, just because the crop is was considered waste, so you might be using stalks of, of uh, corn, for example, or maize, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be free to you. And there's many cases that have been documented about um, gasification plants, uh, assuming that the, their feedstock is going to be free, and then people understand that they figure out that their crop waste is making somebody else money, and so they want to start charging people for it. So managing that supply chain is, is quite important. Uh, moving on now to talking about wind energy conversion systems. Uh, these work basically by converting the kinetic energy in air to electrical energy. Now, unlike, <laughs> unlike biomass or, or uh, fossil fuel-fired inter uh, internal combustion engines, Wind output is variable and uncertain. You can't just start up a wind turbine whenever you want. It really depends upon the wind resources being there. In addition, wind turbines need to be in windy locations, uh, which sounds obvious, but I think uh, it needs to be reiterated that the wind resource is so important. You need to put it in a, an area that you know is windy, and this often requires a, a tall tower being there. So a typical small wind energy conversion system is shown on the left there. It re it's three blades that rotate along the horizontal axis. Many wind turbines of this size will use just a permanent magnet on the rotor, and that means we can't control the, the frequency or the magnitude of the voltage very well, and so we can't connect a wind turbine directly to an AC system, uh, at least in an off-grid sense. So that means that most wind turbines we actually use to charge batteries. So we'll take the, the AC power out, we'll rectify it to DC, and we'll use it to charge a battery. If we want to supply power to an AC load, we might use a, um, an inverter. So the basic principle of operation for a wind turbine is 
we uh, moving air interacts with the blades of the turbine. The blades have been aerodynamically designed to, to uh, impart lift on the hub. Uh, so this torque causes the hub to rotate, which is connected to the generator shaft. And of course, once we have a, a rotating generator shaft, we can produce electricity. Um, if we want to look at the equations that govern this, we can imagine that the wind turbine interacts with this cylinder of air that passes through its swept area. That cylinder of air is going to have some kinetic energy, and uh, that, that kinetic energy is going to be one-half times its mass times its, its velocity squared. If we want to figure out the power, then we can take the derivative of, of the air, uh, accounting for the speed of the wind, and we get an equation that says the power that's in the air is one-half times the, the swept area times the density of the air times the, the velocity cubed. Now, this is the, the power in the air, and we're not able to harness all of that. Uh, instead, we, we only are able to harness some, uh, some fraction of that, so we multiply this equation by C sub P, which is a power coefficient. Now, I'll note, and this is quite important, that the power, the mechanical power in that, that the turbine harnesses is related cubically to the speed of the wind. So in other words, if we double the velocity of the wind, we actually get an eight-fold increase in the power. So again, putting the wind turbine in a very high wind area is extremely, extremely important because of that cubic relationship. Now, the power that we're able to harness, um, the mechanical power that we're able to harness from that mass of moving air really depends upon the aerodynamics of the blades. And so that power coefficient is going to vary based upon several factors, including like the angle of the blades, um, the number of blades, but also importantly, the tip speed ratio. So the tip speed ratio is just the speed of the tips of the blades um, compared to the speed of the oncoming air. And typically we want a tip speed ratio between about six and eight for most three-bladed wind turbines. Now, just because, uh, just because we uh, design our, our wind turbine to operate at a tip speed ratio that's between six and eight doesn't mean it actually will. We have to actually consider the, the electrical side as well. And so designing wind turbines is actually a bit challenging because you have to co-design the mechanical system and the electrical system. But basically, we want to find where the uh, electrical generator's uh, power curve intersects the wind turbine's mechanical power curve. And that's what's shown on the upper right. There. So in order for the generator to produce power at steady state, the mechanical power needs to equal the electrical power. And you can see that this isn't always, the, the two lines, the dashed lines and the colored solid lines don't always intersect at the, the maximum of the colored line. So in other words, if we look at that 12 meters per second uh, a mechanical power curve, we see that we're actually over speeding with this generator. So the generator is not well matched for the um, blades, uh, for the wind turbine part uh, for this particular example. But nonetheless, um, you know, a well-designed turbine will have a, a power curve, which is shown at the bottom, and that power curve relates wind speed to power output. And so even though there might be some wind, it doesn't mean that the wind turbine is actually producing power um, there has to be a, a minimum amount of kinetic energy to, just to get the blades to rotate. And then finally, for the, the wind turbine to be able to produce an, a high enough voltage for the, uh, the rectifier to be able to charge the battery. So uh, I think maybe the biggest drawback to using wind turbines is assessing the wind resource. Wind uh, is affected by local conditions. And so you really don't know if an area is windy until you've actually gone there and taken some measurements. And so uh, measuring the wind speed over a period of time is recommended. And doing that over the course of about a year is really what you need to do in order to have a good sense of how windy it is. So obviously this adds time and uh, adds a lot of expense. And I think this is probably the biggest drawback to using wind. Um, you also have to have towers, and so this takes uh, some engineering to, to figure out the t <laughs> how tall the tower and the, the civil works associated with it. I'll just point out that the cost of the tower is often about the same cost as the turbine, so don't underestimate the, the cost of the towers. Um, just to recap here, wind, uh, using wind for powering off-grid systems, you know, we like wind because there's no fuel costs, no emissions. Uh, it's possible that it's windy in the evening, which is great if your load is also uh, heaviest in the evening. 
it's really hard to steal a wind turbine. <laughs> There's a big tower there. It's actually possible to construct a wind turbine uh, using local local materials. And there's a few uh, references that you see there um, uh, if you want to know how to make your own. I would say the disadvantages for using wind is that it's a relatively high upfront cost, particularly with solar decreasing. The wind resource, again, is difficult to assess ahead of time. You really need to take on, on-site measurements. Um, wind turbines are also quite conspicuous. Um, we, we've worked up with some wind turbines, and uh, you can see those wind turbines from miles away. And so that might draw unwanted attention to, uh, to your, your uh, system. Uh, in addition, you know, there could be some bird or bat, bat strikes, uh, which, which could be an issue. And then uh, towers require maintenance and can also be safety risks. So uh, we'll move on to microhydro, and I'll speed things up here just to make sure that we have enough time for questions. But in my opinion, if you have a, a location where there's an adequate hydro resource, microhydro is what you should go with. Uh, my, microhydro systems, they last a really long time. They uh, can be easily controlled. Uh, maybe one drawback is that you have to require um, some civil uh, structures be built to, to harness the water. But in general, they're going to be the, the most cost-effective uh, type of off-grid power source. So typically how they, they work is we find a location where there's a river and there's steep terrain. And high up um, in, in the mountains or the hills, we divert a portion of the water away from the river into a penstock. And a penstock you can think of as just being a pipe. And so the water flows through this penstock um, all the way down to our powerhouse, which is located down, down river where it uh, interacts with the turbine, and then the water is returned to the river. So two things to note here. First is that we only use a portion of, of the river. We, we don't divert the whole river. The second is that the turbine itself isn't immersed in the river. Um, we don't immerse the turbine in the river itself because uh, there's lots of debris and there's lots of challenges. So we only using a portion of the water and then the, the turbine itself is just fed by the penstock. We don't place it, uh, we don't submerge it in the river itself. You can think of a, a hydro turbine operating based upon the potential energy of the water at its intake. So a volume of water at elevation has potential energy, and that potential energy is um, a, a function of the, the distance between the turbine and that water, uh, the density of the water, the volume of the water, and, of course, the gravitational constant. Now, typically, the, the actual measured distance between the turbine and the elevated uh, volume of water um, we call that the total head, and generally speaking, the energy available to the turbine isn't based on the total head, but it's based on the effective head. And so we reduce the total head by some percentage based upon, you know, losses that we expect to incur within the pen stock and so forth. But as that, that uh, volume of water moves down the pen stock, we actually have a flow of water, and so we can calculate the, the um, power in that water. And that power in that water then is just related to the density, the gravity, and the head and the flow rate. So it's the head and the flow rate that really dictate the power that we have available in our turbine. Now, there are many turbines uh, types that we can use in our microhydro power system. And each turbine is, is, is going to be designed to operate at a certain uh, head. So most microhydro operate at high and medium head, meaning Pelton, Crossflow, Francis, and Turgo turbines are going to be the types of technologies that we use. Pelton and Crossflow are, are very, very common. So when I say high and medium head, I'm talking about you know 10 to maybe 100 meters uh, in in um, head. Now it's really important that you pick the right turbine. If you pick the wrong turbine for your application, that turbine is really not going to operate very effect, uh, effect, uh, efficiently. So most turbines are going to have some sort of uh, efficiency curve, which is based upon uh, a certain RPM that they operate at. Now, that RPM might or might not be the RPM that the generator that's coupled to the turbine needs to be driven at. And so if there's a mismatch there, basically you're going to be operating your turbine at a, uh, in an inefficient level or an inefficient operating state. So to make sure that you operate your turbine at an efficient, uh, an efficient state, there's a couple of approaches. One is calculating the specific speed 
uh, the specific speed of your water resource given the rotational requirements of your generator. And you compare it to like a table, which is shown, or a chart or a table, like uh, is shown on the bottom left. Another way is to use a turbine application chart. <clears throat> so you enter your, um, your, your flow and your head, and you see where those, uh, those coordinates lie. So see that red X? That's for one, uh, one particular site. And given the flow rate of, of, un of slightly under 10 liters per second and a head of maybe 20 meters, for this one kilowatt system, we'd be wanting to use like a Pelton turbine. Um, so these application charts really are useful in at matching up the right generator or the right turbine with, with the application. Now, a, a huge advantage of using microhydro is the fact that we can connect them directly to an AC load. So by diverting just a portion of the river, we can ensure that the pen stock is always full of water. And so we can always supply mechanical power to our, our turbine and rotate the generator um, 24 hours a day. To maintain a constant frequency, we can either use um, a spear valve to adjust the amount of uh, water into the turbine, or we can use an electronic load controller, which basically balances any change in the electrical load um, with uh, power to a resistive load. So I'm, I'm not going to go into that in more details. The book has uh, more details of that if you're interested. And this is just a picture of a microhydro system. Uh, you can see there are uh, water coming from penstocks and two, two pipes. So this is a, a multi-jet uh, Pelton turbine. There is a spear valve. Uh, the turbine itself is enclosed. You can't see it, but you can see the generator, which it's coupled to through a, a drive system there. Microhydro power we like uh, because it's, it's relatively inexpensive. The fuel is free. These can last at a really, really, uh, they can last for a really long time because they operate consistently and at low temperature, so they last a really long time. They can be AC coupled or DC coupled. Um, it's a very, very mature technology. Now, balancing those advantages are a few disadvantages. Mostly, you know, they have to be custom designed um, for the water resource. Adequate water resources aren't everywhere. Um, and uh, you really are impacting a broader community. Uh, anybody downstream, you're going to be a, a affecting in some way. So there's a lot more stakeholders involved. Now I'll wrap up with talking about PV arrays. And I'll be fairly quick here because there's a whole bunch of resources about solar online. But solar panels are increasingly common. You can find them, you can find them everywhere. They're becoming cheaper. They also inherently output DC. So if we have a battery system, we don't need um, a rectifier or, any, or anything like that. Many places that's, that struggle with access to electricity are in places where there's adequate uh, solar radiation. But like wind, you know, power from solar is variable and uncertain, so we don't have that on-demand aspect of solar. So how a solar panel works, it's actually just a diode. It's a dope silicon, um, it's a dope piece of silicon that uh, uh, has a PN junction within it. And it relies on the photovoltaic effect where we have photons exciting electrons within that PN junction. These electrons jump up from the, the tightly held valence bound, uh, band to the, the more free conduction band. And a PN junction has a built-in electric field, which will separate these electrons, uh, and, and a voltage is produced. And so actually a circuit model for um, a PV cell is shown on the right, and it's uh, you can see a diode representing the PN junction and a current source that represents the, the current that's produced by the photon. Uh, what we need to know about solar is that their output is approximately proportional to the amount of sunlight. So yes, solar does work on a cloudy day, but its power output will be reduced significantly. In addition, the higher the temperature, the lower the power output. So we really like sunny, cool areas for solar. Um, an important aspect of solar is that there is a unique operating point where its power output is maximized. So if we look at the current and voltage curve of a solar cell, which is shown at the top, when we multiply the, the voltage and current at every point along that curve, we get that dashed blue line, uh, which is shown at the bottom. And we note that there's a unique point in which the power is operated, uh, the, the power is maximized, I should say. And so that means there's a unique voltage that the, the power is optimized at. And that unique voltage may or may not correspond to the battery voltage. In fact, it's most likely will not. 
So if we take our PV panel and connect it directly to a, a battery, we're probably not going to be optimizing the, the power output of that panel. Even if it's really sunny, it still means that we're opter, operating in a suboptimal way. So one way around that is to use what's called a maximum power point tracker. And a maximum power point tracker is a device that sits between the PV array and the battery. And what it does is it decouples the PV voltage from the battery voltage. Um, and how this works is um, we, it, you can look at the curve at the bottom and basically if we didn't have the maximum power point tracker, uh, the PV panel would be operating at point B, which is the battery voltage. But because we have the, the maximum power point tracker there, the battery is able to, excuse me, the, the PV is able to operate at point A, its maximum power point, and um, the, the battery voltage on the, on, uh, excuse me, the maximum point power point tracker on the battery side is operating at point C. Point A and point C correspond to the same power. So in other words, the maximum power point tracker isn't producing power. It's simply making the solar panel operate in a more uh, efficient way. And so there's several methods possible. If you're interested in maximum PowerPoint tracking, you can look at references uh, seven and eight. So to summarize PV, you know, there's no fuel cost, it's quiet, there's low maintenance, very, very modular, so you can easily expand systems. Uh, the supply chains are, are becoming more mature. On the downside though, the power, you know, it varies with the radiance and temperature. Um, you often need charge controllers and batteries they're more expensive, at least in terms of capital costs and gen sets and some of the other technologies. Um, and there's relatively low power density, so you actually need a lot of real estate for PV arrays. Um, now, most of the time we think of uh, well-engineered systems for mini grids, but if you travel around many of these communities, you'll find a lot of improvised systems. So I just wanted to show a few examples of that. The bottom left is an improvised wind turbine uh, that I came across in Zambia. Uh, sort of in the middle there, you see a, a hydro turbine where uh, these are soda bottles that are used as nozzles, and you can see the turbine uh, rotating just above the gentleman's hand there. Uh, a PV system is shown at the bottom, although you can't see the panel, you can see the inverter and battery. And then on the right, you see a, a battery charging scheme. Uh, speaking of batteries, our webinar on January 16th, it's going to be all about batteries. So. Uh, many engineers, if you're not a chemical engineer anyway, batteries are this big black boxes of chemicals. We don't really understand how they operate. So I'm going to do what I can to demystify batteries. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, communicate how we can interpret spec sheets and basically uh, provide you uh, with, with the knowledge you need to select the proper battery, battery for your off-grid system. So uh, we're, I'm happy. Uh, here are the references. Uh, and you can view these when this, the webinar is, is archived if you want to uh, uh, write down the specific details. But I'm happy to take uh, questions. So thanks for listening. And I'll turn it back to the moderator uh, for, for questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Henry. This was uh, incredible as always. I will try to pass along some of the questions. I know there's uh, it was a heated conversation while you were presenting which is always great to see. <laughs> um, so yeah. I will try to pass the ones that uh, were written. If you guys have any other questions aside from the ones that I'm asking, please write them on the Q&A chat, okay? And I will be sure to pass along. So from Bill Radcliffe, he says, as a mechanical uh, power source, gas turbine engines are apparently not included, nor are they hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, yeah. Are they recent purely financial, or are there any other considerations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So let me let me kind of clarify the context of, of what we're talking about here. Absolutely, microgrids that you see in uh, Europe, uh, Asia, the U.S., yeah, absolutely, you can use fuel cells, you can use gas-powered turbines. In, in rural areas, however, I, I don't know that I've ever really come across a mini-grid that, that used a, um, a fuel cell. Uh, Natural gas turbines, uh, sure. I think they're they're relatively uncommon. Uh, just the supply chain is difficult to manage. So I'm sure that there are some that use gas turbines. They're probably larger systems, more sophisticated microgrids. Uh, certainly, the smaller ones are more likely to use diesel or petrol. And there's, of course, there's other energy sources 
that in theory could be used to power off-grid systems, um, but really don't see, for example, geothermal used in off-grid systems. Those are much larger in scale. You wouldn't see a, a little community using a geothermal power plant. It, it would be very rare. It's probably probably doesn't even exist. But great, great question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, that's great. I saw, you know, during the conversation the, in the chat, they were asking about your open source one turbine, and I think um, oh, sure. we asked, we uh, answered them, but they were still asking. So if you want, uh, if you have the link there, uh, Henry, we can post it here or uh, pass it along afterwards. Uh, sure. So uh, I'm not sure what what exact link. Uh, is being referred to. I haven't been following the chat while I was talking, but yeah, uh, I've I've worked on open source wind turbines. Um, really, there there's a lot of resources on this. Uh, Hugh Piggott is really the per person that uh, popularized this this wind uh, you know do it yourself wind turbine, um, and. Uh, so there's so if you look up Hugh Piggott, he's he's the the person behind all of it. Um, there's also a book called Homebrew uh, Wind Power, which is written by two gentlemen out of Colorado that does a step by step uh, instruction on how to how to build your own wind turbine. Um, in my experiences with wind turbines, they're 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 I think a bit of a novelty. I mean, you can do it. It's fun. It's rewarding to do it. You can show that it can be done with local materials. Uh, but I think they struggle with being able to manufacture them at scale, and the maintenance can be challenging. So I wouldn't recommend, for example, a group of people in the U.S. building their own wind turbine, bringing it to, to Kenya, and installing it, and then leaving, because wind turbines do require quite a bit of maintenance, especially homemade wind turbines. Um, it's interesting if if I had a cabin in the U.S. Uh, that was off grid, I would I would consider making my own wind turbine there. But uh, if you're going to power a whole community whose livelihood depends upon that wind turbine being operational, um, I would have second thoughts. And there's actually quite a bit of research where people have gone back and they've looked at um, different wind turbines, commercially made wind turbines too, and the overall success hasn't been too promising. There's there's quite a bit of maintenance that's required. Okay, but uh, the otherpower.com, is that from you, Henry? Uh, other power, I believe, and no, that's not me. I believe that's the uh, people that wrote the homebrew wind power book, uh, Dan Fink okay. and Dan Bartman. I believe that's okay. other power. But yeah, you can you can order many of the wind turbine parts from them. Uh, so yeah, I would, I, I've ordered stuff from them. So you can check them out. You can get the magnets from them. Uh, you can get like the templates. So if you're interested in building your own wind turbine, sure, go check them out. Great. Thank you for clarifying because it was a heated discussion around this <laughs> topic. Okay. So if, if you yeah. guys have any further questions, uh, please let me know. Okay. I will pass along to another question, question here from Pranav. Can we also burn plastic indirectly and then heat the water and process the flue gases like an incinerator? Oh, uh, probably, but again, I think it comes down comes down to scale. I mean, uh, certainly there are countries in sub-Saharan Africa that have uh, waste uh, waste to energy conversion facilities where they burn essentially trash and uh, create steam and run steam turbines. Uh, it's really tricky to run a steam turbine at a very at small scale. Um, you you need to have some sort of manufacturing facility, some some something that that aggregates a lot of trash, and uh, has a large facility where it makes sense to have a, a steam turbine. It's hard to make a steam turbine efficient at a very small scale. I mean, you, you, there's so many considerations there. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have another question here. How do you feel like the small modular nuclear reactors work uh, that are connected to local grids? Uh, I mean, or you certainly hear. Connected? Yeah, you hear more and more about these these small uh, nuclear reactors, like five megawatt or smaller size. Um, I, I think it's going to be a while before those find their way into rural communities, and and I think if they. I think their bigger contribution would actually be to be grid connected and then use grid extension to power these communities. I, I would think that there would just be 
uh, so many other considerations in installing a, a nuclear reactor in a in a remote village. Uh, <laughs> you probably want to put it in a more secure location and then just run power lines to the village uh, from it, or provide power to the whole the whole grid. Okay, got it. We have another interesting question regarding the recycling of solar panels. Is it possible to yeah. manufacture green panels less polluting? Have you seen any examples? Uh, there's certainly a lot of talk now about what we're going to do when when panels. I mean, worldwide, there's just so many uh, solar panels that are out there, and you know, solar panel lasts for maybe 20 years, and so at some point, we're going to have a whole bunch of solar solar panel uh, panel waste that's going out there. Uh, solar panels themselves aren't the easiest thing to recycle. Um, uh, I mean, there is there is some aluminum and maybe some copper in there, uh, but it takes a lot of effort to actually recycle it. So it's a problem. I think it's an open problem, and I think uh, we need better solutions for it. Now, at the village scale, uh, you know, waste collection in general is a problem at, at, in villages. I mean, if you walk around many of these villages, it's not like there's a, a trash collector that comes by once a week and picks up the trash. I mean, yeah. water bottles just sit there, uh, you know, plastics yeah. just sit there on the ground. So waste disposal and recycling is a big issue in these communities in general, you know, independent of, of um, the energy production side. Yeah, that's a, a big issue that we should really start figuring out, correct? Okay, so yeah. we have, where can we get more info on my, micro hydro or mini hydro? Yeah, um, yeah, so of course I'll say my book has some information. Um, there are quite a few resources, uh, practical resources uh, that, that um, are available. So I would look up, um, uh, I think I have one here on my desk. Uh, there's, there's a book called Serious Microhydro by Scott Davis. Uh, that's, a, that's a good book that describes microhydropower systems. There are a few books out there by Practical Action, uh, that describe how to actually make your own microhydropower uh, using like Pelton turbines. So there's actually quite a few resources that are out there. Um, I would encourage uh, whoever asked that question, if, if you uh, want to contact me or if you look at the book, there are several resources that I cite within that book um, that describe microhydro in, in more detail. Great. Yeah, and he, I think your book would be the – the best answer, because you can you <laughs> repeat the name and and where can they find them, Henry? Yeah, so well, the name of my book is uh, Off Grid Electrical Systems in Developing uh, Countries, and you if you just Google that, you'll you'll come up with the place to get it. You can get it on uh, Amazon for about ninety dollars a hard copy on Kindle. It's I think about seventy dollars, something like that. Um, but there are books that are dedicated just to hydropower. Um, uh, one one, one uh, author that I, I like is, um, his name is Scott Davis, and he has, I think, two books that are related to practical experiences in microhydro. It won't necessarily tell you how to design the system, but it'll give you a feel for what goes into systems, and it'll give you a bunch of different real practical examples. And then there are, there's, there's quite a few books that are out there that go into detail about how how uh, how to design the pen stock, how to design the intake structures. Uh, so, you know, I consult your library or, or do a, a Google search, or you feel free to email me, and I can pass on a short list of other references that I found I found helpful. Great, Henry. So we have two more minutes, and I just wanted to ask you in general, so that we close up the the webinar. Which generate system is the most common in the world, and which one do you think should be? Given the sustainability, the um, uh, maybe the continuous uh, fuel or of energy or source, which one do you think should, we should be moving towards? Yeah, great question. Well, I I I, <clears throat> I think globally there's a lot of advantage to solar. Um, I would say hydro, but there's only that only works in relatively few places. Like you have to have a good hydro resource to try it. But one great thing about solar is it's really easy to tell if a community has an adequate solar resource. I mean, there's open access databases that that can tell you for any square meter uh, on on Earth, any meter on Earth, you know, any location, what the solar radiance is going to be like, and it'll be fairly accurate. 
that we don't have databases like that for wind. I mean, the closest you get is maybe a kilometer or two kilometers um, in resolution, but uh, and it varies so much locally. So I like wind, or excuse me, I like solar. It's it's coming down in price. It's easy to design a system uh, based upon uh, available solar irradiance data. I would say that perhaps the most common system, though, is probably gensets. I mean, in Nigeria, there's like 100 million just in Nigeria. <laughs> so there's still quite a few of those that are out there. And, of course, that's, there's lots of challenges with that pollution and, and fuel costs and so forth. Great, Henry. I think that's a great um, end to our webinar. I want to thank you for this uh, great presentation. The chat, we still have many questions there. They're asking for reference. They're asking for more information. So be sure to check Henry's um, book out and uh, be sure to, if you have any other questions, be sure to reach out to him. The information about how to obtain a PDH uh, and if you have any further questions, questions about the webinar, it's on the slide right now. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Henry, for a great presentation. And be sure to check our next uh, webinar around off-grid energy. Thank you. Thank you.